Welcome to Better Sex, where you get the information and inspiration to create and enjoy your best possible sex life. Join your host, sex therapist Jessa Zimmerman, as she brings you expert guests, helpful tips, knowledge, and strategies to improve your intimate relationships. And now, your host, Jessa Zimmerman. Hey, welcome back to the Better Sex Podcast. This is Jessa, back for another show, and so glad you're here with me. We've got an interesting topic today. We're talking about cyber infidelity. And my guest, Dr. Peter Canaris, he points out that really all infidelity these days interacts with the cyber world because even if we met somebody in person, we're probably maintaining something through devices, but it's now just so pervasive. We have so much access and things come across our vision, our landscape, you know, without invitation sometimes. So it's become incredibly complicated. And where do we draw lines, right? Every couple gets to decide what our agreements are and whatnot. And the cyber access we have really complicates these conversations. There's a lot more potentially gray area here for you. So he's going to talk about what capital I infidelity and lowercase I infidelity and what his treatment approach involves and how a couple really can we rebuild trust if there has been dishonesty and infidelity in the cyber age. So hopefully you will take a ton from this discussion. And before we start the show today, it is sponsored by Intimacy with Ease. It's a method to help otherwise happy couples achieve a sex life that is easy and fun for both of them. So you can actually just enjoy your sex life with zero stress. For more information, if you want to watch a brief little training video that's available, all of that, go to intimacywithease.com. All right, Peter, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Jessa. Uh, I'm excited to talk about, I, I don't know if I should be excited about this digital, you know, cyber infidelity, because this is just coming up all the time, right? The internet, the access we have, the kinds of things people are doing and how to frame that. So how do you think this is impacting relationships in general, maybe the digital age? And then we could talk specifically about what kind of trouble people might be getting into. Well, yeah, it's a good place to start because I think even before you consider uh, infidelity, the digital age, the way I phrase it is I see it as a relationship accelerator. And I think it accelerates the good and the bad. People now digitally will get together, will meet each other. That's the most common way, of course, that people will date or will get to meet each other. So the access and the way, the opportunities to connect electronically Um, has made it easier and faster in the development of a relationship, I think, than any time before in human history, really. Right, right. Now, the other side of that, of course, it makes it also easier and faster for things to go wrong. (laughs) That makes sense. (laughs) It's just so much a part of our lives, you know, and the development, despite my incredibly youthful appearance, I'm actually an older guy, and I've been around for a long time. So I've seen relationships in the 20th century and in the 21st century. And it's the development of relationships, the impact of relationships, totally different. The other thing that strikes me, and this is sort of a different than our topic today, but there's also this element of comparison and living up to, you know, things are so visible now and other people are so visible and we get these expectations or ideas about what should be happening or how are we presenting or there's this yep. whole world of presentation that I think that happens with the digital age that we didn't have before either. What happens is, again, we are constantly flooded with comparisons, social media, things are coming our way. We're exposed instantly and frequently to things that, you know, prior to the internet, you just kind of bump into in a conversation. Basically, there was less access to everything and life moved more slowly. Right, right. Now it's like this flood of pictures, images, and feelings. 
Yeah. And again, like good and bad, right? That relationship can move faster, but so can the problems. And the access to information is great. Like all of a sudden we can find out we're not alone with this problem, but we can also get a really distorted view of what life should be like. Yes. Yes. What I might add to that in terms of this in recent times, I think that has further been accelerated by the pandemic Uh. because it's, it's pushed us more towards our devices. We're living life, relatively speaking, more so in the cave. Yeah. You know, what we brought into the cave with us is our, our smartphones and our laptops and all that. So what we're describing, I think, has been further accelerated by the way we've been living in the last year. Right, right. Because we can't get out and socialize and do these other things that would be real world interactions so much. Yeah. So we're, yeah. we're. I, in fact, I'm thinking about all the different groups that I now have regular Zoom gatherings with, you know, yes. I college roommates and family and things that we weren't, we weren't touched that much at all. And all of a sudden, that's our only way to contact anybody. Which again, the good and the bad, it's kind of forced us and we've had the time and the inclination to maybe to reach out to some folks in our general sphere, social sphere that maybe we weren't really in contact with or, or reaching out to. And now we've done some of that on the good side. Yeah. So I don't know if you want to start with the kinds of things that people can get into that are problematic, or do you sort of want to start with the definition of what cyber infidelity is? Like, you know, because I imagine that people view that line differently. Like, what's actually cheating or not? But you know, what are the yeah. possibilities here for people to be doing things that violate relationship agreements? Yes, yes. Well, the whole concept of cheating and infidelity, as I was sort of suggesting before, has changed ever so dramatically. And really, now all infidelity is cyber infidelity. Because very rarely, I mean, there are exceptions where someone will still meet at the water cooler or in person, but more commonly, the either first contact or maintenance of the relationship is done electronically. Okay. And so I'll talk about uh, the distinction between 20th century versus 21st century cheating. And it's dramatically different. In the 20th century, it would be out there. You'd be at work or you'd be in the gym, or you'd be uh, at a bar. And now the infidelity uh, or the cheating would get take place and get going in that way. Now, it comes to you. I've been looking at social media, at one of the social media sites. Uh, an old flame is suddenly appears. A conversation gets going. Intimacies start to develop. Or I just kind of go down the rabbit hole of porn and and I kind of get lost in that. So the mechanism is totally different. And it's now something that comes to you. The, the analogy that I sometimes use is like, is the analogy to bullying. If you take a kid, again, in the old days, a kid would need to go to school and get bullied in the schoolyard or the cafeteria or out there. Now, bullying actually occurs in the home where through social media uh, and through electronic contact, the bully kind of comes into the house and yeah. comes to you. There's a fair analogy there to uh, to infidelity. You don't need to be inclined toward infidelity. You don't have to actively seek it. It comes at you. But it also does seem like in the internet age here, it is much easier to seek it out too. Whereas, yes. you know, if you yeah. just go to a bar and somebody happens to be there, it's, you know, it's kind of random, but, you know, you could sign up for Ashley Madison or whatever. I mean, like, yes. it's so easy to seek it out also. That is true. It's the accessibility. When we think of what were the developments that really changed things? Well, obviously, first was the Internet. OK, the other major developments, social media. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the smartphone in 2000. And these things, if you think about it. You know, Facebook was 2004. The iPhone was 2007. And these dramatic portals to infidelity, yeah. either the coming at us or, as you say, the, the inclination to go seek it out has made it so prevalent and so easy that it's right there. And more challenges are coming in the future with AI, with robotics and all of this. Right, uh, it, right. It be a whole new challenges to, to relationships. It also seems, you know, somewhat anonymous or people don't, you know, if you go out to bar, your friend might see you there. Bob might realize, what are you doing out here without your wife or whatever? Yes. You know, you're on the internet. Nobody, generally, nobody knows what you're doing. It's depersonalized. Yes. Like, it just seems yes. like, wow, it'd be easy to get on you know, a slippery slope here. Well, I think aptly, I use the acronym app 
three A's and, and a P. Accessibility, affordability, yeah. anonymity, yeah. and the P is for portability, rather. So in other words, what really changed it now was what I call the 13th digit, the smartphone, which yeah. is perpetually on our bodies, in our hands. Cheating occurs now where uh, one person is sitting on the couch and the other person is three feet away sitting on a chair in the living room. Right, or, right. Or the phone goes into the bathroom and goes, it's just, it's with us all the time, you know, where that was not the case. You had to go, you used to have to go out and make arrangements and figure out. And, and there were more obstacles that unless you were highly motivated and that's what you wanted to do. Now it's just like breathing. Yeah. I know there's not one answer to this question, but where's the line to infidelity versus interacting or looking at pictures or looking at porn or, or you know, and I, I know to some degree, it's got to be up to each couple, I suppose, to figure out where these lines are. But how do you have that conversation or what? Where are some of the distinctions that you see where it gets to be a problem? This is an important question, okay? And it's a big question. And let me take it apart in, in several ways. Starting with the last thing that you were implying is that couples really need to have a discussion, to have a conversation about the use of technology, all right? Because there's what I call with infidelity, I think in, in the digital age, there's the big I and the small I, uppercase and lowercase. <laughs> okay. All right. Uppercase infidelity is where the implicit or explicit contract that two or more people have regarding what are the rules of the relationship? What's acceptable? What's unacceptable? What do they consent to? What do they agree to? All right. And now, very often, people just kind of roll into that without even thinking about it. Right, right. And that's a, a preventative for being able to stay away from the uppercase I infidelity. So uppercase where, I is violating those agreements. Is a violation of those agreements uh, r resulting in the involvement with the love or sexual involvement with another person or I'll say entity. Okay, because we're coming with robotics and AI. We're not going to need a human being, all right? But are you saying physical involvement, like in-person, real life, or it could all be like in a chat room? Every, everything goes. It could be a purely electronic involvement. It could be face-to-face. -face. It could involve sex. It could involve just uh, feelings and emotion. So all of that has to be considered for what's in, based on what we want and what we find acceptable, what's okay, what's not okay. What's okay with you? What's okay with me? Okay, so capital I is violating those agreements in some way that involves a lot of or sexual feelings, thoughts, behavior, whatever. <laughs> okay. That is correct. Okay. Now, the lower case, the small infidelity is when we come to realize that, Siri, I love you. I love you. Oh, Alexa, you are for me. So now we've triangulated that relationship because this device okay, that exists based upon grabbing eyeballs, grabbing attention, uh, getting likes, getting clicks, doing all of that, my relationship, my intense involvement with this machine, okay, whatever it might be, maybe it's a laptop, maybe something else, that, that you know what I'm not doing? Paying you know attention what? to my partner, <laughs> right? Dar darling, I'm not paying attention to you, Yeah. okay? And it's and it, it's not because I'm necessarily sexually involved or uh, or, or that kind of faith has been broken, but my attention has been monopolized by this thing, and the other human being who's involved in the, or human beings that are involved in this relationship are going to be affected by that and have feelings by that, and that small I I find far more common and almost universal in relationships as an issue. But that also makes me think children can consume your energy to the detriment of your your partner. Yes. Uh, you, you can work constantly and be focused on that instead of your partner. Like that's a, yeah. that's not just cyber stuff, right? Like this is sort of what Stan Tatkin would probably call the mismanagement of thirds, which is. Yeah, OK. Right. Okay. And, and that's fair. But what I would say is, you know what? I got to work. I'm working for us. I'm working for the family. I'm putting food on the table. Right. We got to take care of the kids. They're they're not going anywhere. 
I can't just say, you know, go out and play and I'll see you some other day. These are responsibilities. Yeah. This thing in my hand. And of course, now the electronics are relevant for work and so many other things. But my involvement with that goes beyond those other necessities. Yeah. It's my pastime. It's my enjoyment. It's my love. I love my Siri. And this is something that also requires a conversation for, hey, and not, and not a one-time conversation, but sort of an on, ongoing dialogue of let's keep an eye on how we can manage this thing, okay, that we, that's part of our lives. It's not going anywhere. We, we use it. We love it. We need it, but we don't want it to hurt us. We don't want it, we don't want it to grab so much time away from each other that uh, before we know it, we're knee deep and it's, it's hurting our relationship. And I imagine these two things don't have to go together. I mean, it's not like somebody who's sort of obsessed with their phone and getting ding, 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 seeing all the notifications like that isn't inevitably going to lead to the capital I <laughs> infidelity. I mean, I, I imagine it could, but they seem yeah. like kind of distinct. No, issues. I, think you're right. I think you're right. What I would say is the universality of this, of the small eye, what I'm calling the small eye inf infidelity requires an early and often conversation about management of this technology okay not because we're afraid of another party's involvement or nothing like that okay that is separate from the big eye okay? okay are they on a continuum are they completely qualitatively different i'm not sure but they are different and one is common and, and regular and the other one is something else okay so let me ask you in terms of the capital i infidelity Cyber yes. infidelity. <laughs> yes. What are the kinds of things that people are doing that two partners would want to make agreements about? Like, what are the possibilities here <laughs> that people should be aware of and discuss and be like, is this okay or is this not okay? Where's our line? Yeah. Well, it's it's very broad and it really it will vary with the particular partnership and what people feel they're comfortable with. Is it okay to flirt online? Is it okay to have deep emotional connections online? Is it okay? I Gee, I'm really enjoying uh, camming, okay? And, and I'm, I, I'd like to sex. How do, is that okay? Is it acceptable? The uh, Anything goes, okay, as long as there's consensus and consent and the two people find it agreeable. Where we run into trouble is with secrecy. When I'm now going to have this quiet, secret involvement in relationship via my device mm -hmm. with another person, you know, whether there's uh, sex involved or emotion involved or confiding great intimacies, uh, whatever the case may be, that's where it tends to go off the rails. So we really need to kind of talk about that a little bit and like what's okay and and what really solves it is openness. Yeah. Okay. If I can be open and, and I'm not secretive, okay, I still have my privacy. I'm a, I'm entitled to be a private person. No one can invade the, the little box between my ears. That's for me. But as long as I am not engaging in hiding behaviors and secretive behaviors, in behaviors that I have to ask myself, if my partner were doing this, would I be comfortable with it? Okay. If not, is it something that I should sort of reveal and talk about? Yeah. Or even if I would be comfortable with it, if I already know my partner would not be, and yeah. that's why I'm being secretive. Like yes. I wouldn't care if she commented on her ex-boyfriend's pictures, but I know she'd be unhappy with me. So uh, yes. yeah. Yes. And, and then to be able to have a, a basically just a, a, a a non-accusatory, non-defensive conversation that, hey, you know, I, I noticed that you've been talking a lot with Mary. Yeah, I'm not saying you're doing anything wrong, but I got to be honest, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable. What is any, what's happening there? So now we talk about that where I'm not hurling accusations and it's not inviting uh, a defensiveness. So it becomes uh, a negative kind of destructive conversation. Yeah, it, it, it stays uh, friendly. It stays cooperative. I, and I'm trying to think of some of the kinds of things clients have talked to me about. I mean, there's and I don't even quite know how to categorize this. They're sort of like looking at things like pornography or something like that. That's totally not non-responsive. You know, it's a one way it's a one way thing. Uh, yes. But sometimes people are concerned with that. Then I guess we get to something like there's a little bit of response. We're commenting on an ex's pictures or yeah. 
Yes. Starting a conversation with somebody we used to know or something, not with any ill intent. Mm -hmm. And then I guess there's the interacting with people you don't know. What I don't even know, chat rooms or um, webcams or asking people to do things or something. Yeah. And and you don't know. And and you mentioned pornography. That's another area that couples or partnerships really need to have a conversation about how they feel about it. Is it, you know, do we both participate? Is uh, not my thing, but I'm okay with you looking at it. I'm really uncomfortable with you looking at it. We have that conversation and develop uh, what's acceptable and okay for each. And it might be one doing a little less than they'd really like to do and the other one giving a little bit more, but it stays within bounds of okayness and and acceptability in in that regard. But it comes back to that conversation and being able to talk about it. Right. And I would imagine, well, I know lots of couples don't have these conversations until they've tripped over one of these things. You know, it's not even necessarily with an intention to cheat, but like, I didn't know you felt that way. Like, and then you fall into this very muddy territory about, wait a minute, what do we each think is okay here? Exactly correct. That's why I always advocate, don't wait till you get to me. I encourage people to have these kinds of discussions and conversations about this thing that plays such a vital, omnipresent, important role in our lives. Yeah. This technology that's there for multi purposes and how we met. Look what we're doing now with the pandemic. Our, our kids are being educated via this technology. Or everything's happening in this way, you know. Right. But what's upsetting to a member of the couple? It, it's wide open. I've had a, an older couple, for instance, where the female of the couple was distressed because uh, the the male partner these are these were older people was looking up famous people, broadcasters, actresses on the internet, and looking for their body measurements. <laughs> okay, and this was this was his his thing. He was also involved a lot with porn and other things as well. But she was feeling that this was an affront to her. Yeah. Okay. And again, no value judgments on any of this. It really boils down to what can these people live with? What do they find acceptable? And how can they work it out and negotiate? Right. Hey, this is Jess. I'm just taking a quick break. And I want to make sure you know about the guide I wrote about how to talk to your partner about sexual concerns. This comes up a lot in my practice. People have struggles and it takes them so long to bring it up with their partner. They're afraid that that conversation is going to go badly. Their partner's going to be upset. The partner's going to be defensive, or they just don't know how to talk about sex and sexual problems. Common, common problem. So I wrote this guide that really helps you address this. It helps you prepare for the conversation how to introduce the conversation, and then tips about how to actually get through the conversation so that you can change things with your partner as a team. If you are interested in this guide, you can find it at bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Again, bettersexpodcast.com slash guide. Happy to send it to you. All right. So let's say we're talking about capital I infidelity. First of all, is it excused by the idea of sex addiction or porn addiction or something like that, that this is somehow out of my control, so I'm not responsible for it? Uh, do you have several hours for this? <laughs> no, no, you got to give a really short answer. <laughs> okay. Well, OK, so sex addiction, all right, has become a category of understanding that has achieved popular acceptance right uh, in the media in uh, you, you, online you hear about it, all that it has not really achieved professional acceptance right. within the professional community it's not in you know the DSM which is the uh, diagnostic and statistical manual the bible of diagnoses it has poor uh, scientific support okay right. however Okay, a a common scenario. Okay, a male is coming into my office. I'm a sex addict. How do I know? Well, my wife told me. Okay. And now I'm in the position where I've got to work with that because if I, if he comes out of my office saying, well, you know, uh, Dr. Canaris, he explained to me I'm not a sex addict. 
that would be one session therapy because he'll be gone because he doesn't need Dr. Canaris. He needs his wife. Yeah. You, okay. So what we do try to do is the model that I work from is a model of out of control sexual behavior. Right. Uh, that's a, a model that is less shaming, less judgmental, but a recognition that a person's uh, sexual behavior feels out of control and is having negative consequences in their life, in their relationship, maybe even at work or uh, where they've been sanctioned for watching porn or whatever the case may be. So now uh, the model that I will follow with that is to help the person become in charge of his or her, more commonly his, sexual behavior, where rather than to be ruled by the sexual behavior, that he's the boss, that he takes charge and determines, develop his own guidelines for sexual wellness, and then works to live within those guidelines, however imperfectly, but largely effectively. All right. So people can struggle to control some of this behavior. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. So it's not because I also believe this is just me that sometimes this is used as a cover. It's not my fault. Yeah. I have this disease, you know, like it can, it can be a, you know, well, trying to well, evade responsibility sometimes. <laughs> what you're describing is exactly true. And that's, see, in my belief, it's what are the great appeals of the concept of sexual addiction? What you just said, it's out of my control. I can't help it. I'm sick. Right. Okay. Right. All right. And it also preserves the partner where, oh, it's not, it's not that I'm not good enough. It's not that I, I got older or I put on 15 pounds. It's that he's got an illness. Yeah. He's, he, and now let me send him into this doctor to get, to get cured. Okay. So th- you could see the appeal of this model that has very little support. Right. All right. right. It's all, but it's also very shaming and it's not an empowering ma- model. There are better ways to go. Right. Right. Then there seems like a difference to me between out of control sexual behavior where somebody is struggling to control these choices and this is not, you know, they identify they want to be living differently than this. And that seems different than someone who's choosing to be unfaithful. Like the mm-hmm. media might be, you know, like it's it's a different thing to be kind of like watching more porn than you want to be watching and potentially hooking up with somebody. Right. Like those motivations seem different to me. Infidelity versus I happen to be overusing this technology. It certainly can be. okay, And that's where in treating this type of situation, a one size fits all that sometimes a sexual addiction approach will sort of encourage or suggest, okay, does not fit. What's needed is a psychological approach where you are as as the professional, you're able to assess, okay, what's going on here? Are there personal issues that are driving the behavior on the part of this person? Is there what we call a comorbidity, undiagnosed bipolar disorder, uh, another uh, another kind of uh, a drug addiction or drug involvement? Is there an unexpressed kink or unrecognized sexual orientation issue that mm-hmm. has not been spoken about or has not emerged? So those are those are individual issues. Then there are relational issues that can drive this in terms of a mismatch of, of these people, a poor communication, poor intimate communication, a sexual problem that might exist for one or both of the people that are involved. And then I was, as I was talking about before, then there's the technology because as therapists, we're accustomed to seeing these individual psychological issues, these addictive issues, these couples types of problems, we've always concluded that's where the problem lies. That's what we have to get to, to figure it out. I maintain what's, what's unique about the model that I use is that you could find a person who is pretty well put together as an individual. You can find a relationship that is basically what would be considered a good relationship that still gets affected by the phenomena of the technology that we are living with. And it draws them in. It draws them in. And now we've got a real problem that has to be addressed. And fortunately, we can do that. (laughs) What do people do? I like I'm trying to it's like I have more questions than when we started, but like, what would be the red flags? I mean, I, I imagine for a lot of partners, their alarms are already going off about this, but what does a partner do who thinks their partner is cheating? Basically, inf- you know, cyber infidelity. And then 
what's the path forward for a you know let's say a couple like this so some per, somebody's been doing this and well, I can tell you what what usually happens and also what I would hope would start to happening more and more as we become more educated consumers and able to understand the psychological phenomena of how we interface with our technologies and how it affects our relationships. But the usual situation is the, a bomb went off. Uh, there's, there's been a discovery of an involvement, and the involvement could be anywhere from excessive uh, porn watching to interactive type of porn involvement, like camming, for instance, yeah. or sexting, or a relationship that now became face-to-face -face, uh, uh, that, that's been around for a while. The, the bomb goes off, and now he's in my office, or they're in my office, okay? In order to avoid that, we need to have those conversations earlier. If I'm uncomfortable, if I feel, you know what, my partner has been spending so much time on his phone or kind of hold up uh, on, on the other in the other room involved, I have to voice that. Uh, not in an accusatory way, but maybe it's just, you know what, uh, again, the small eye. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, right. I'm, I'm feeling a disconnect. I'm feeling a loss of our attention for each other. Can we talk about how we can manage this thing in, in this way? Okay. I want to see, is my partner being open? Are we cryptic? Are we secretive? Are we, oh no, you could never have any of my passwords. I would never let that happen. You know, so, so again, is there an openness and a transparency or a secrecy? If I'm seeing more and more secrecy, that's not just coming as a result of accusatory behaviors on my side. Okay. Whereas if it's a, if it's a conversation and there's an overreaction that's guarding something, now I've got to look further. Yeah. What's the path towards rebuilding trust or rebuilding this relationship or re recovering from infidelity? I've developed an entire model uh, to address that question. What I would say is some, some of the key aspects of the approach that I use is first off to identify that the technology is a challenge, has become a problem. There, if there's if there's out of control behavior to be addressed, we need to address that. Then we need to collaborate and cooperate on the management of the technology. Okay, what typically happens is sort of a uh, a cat and mouse game, or uh, what I call the sex police. Now, <laughs> the guy is going to be indicted. He's going to be he's going to be checked on what he's going to be caught. He's going to hide. The posture has to be, we're in this together. And then there's a phenomenon known uh, from years back in, in family therapy of externalization of the problem. We've got to, instead of, oh, gee, he's this sick, addictive degenerate, or instead of locating the problem within the person, unless there's something that has to be addressed within the right, person, right. we locate the problem out there. It's this thing that we have to manage collaboratively, cooperatively, and in good spirit with each other to figure out how can we downsize this beast? How can we contain it together? That's one aspect, that externalization and that collaborative management. The next step that comes in, which is major, is trust, because typically trust has been shattered. And this is the double bind. The double bind is that, okay, well, he wants me to trust him again. My friends, my family, once a liar, always a liar. You're dealing with things like this. There have been probably multiple discoveries of misbehaviors of this kind. So I got to examine, how am I going to trust? Okay. Well, the model of trust that we typically enter relationships with, I, I call it the blind faith model. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love you, my darling. You're the one for me. I trust you implicitly until something goes very wrong. And then I don't know what the hell to do. At that point, my choice is I return to the blind faith model, which makes me feel like a fool. Which, yeah, now I have to disregard the evidence I've got that you could actually cheat. <laughs> so, I, I, have, I have to disregard, just trust me. Yeah. I, I disregard the evidence that, that you can cheat, or I got to break up with you, or I'll never... Or I'll, I'll constantly accuse you. I'll constantly check your phone. Either way, it's terrible. It does, it does not work out. Okay. 
Hence, you already uh, used the, the, uh, the appropriate word. We need a new model for trust, okay? which I refer to as an evidence-based model of trust. And that might suggest or invite the thought that, oh, well, you're going to turn her into the sex police and she's going to have to be just... No, 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 no. Okay. That goes back to the collaborative management of devices and electronics, where now the violator of the person that broke faith, okay, will take the lead in transparency, in reassuring that there is no secrecy, and even for a time, and some of my colleagues, I I think, won't like this, will put up with the limitation on privacy. What do you mean? We all, how can you infringe upon? The only way we're going to put this baby back together is by a person who's willing to say, I can abridge my privacy for a time in the service of providing you hard fact reassurance that there are differences here. The same old thing is not going on. And now over time, what happens? Now I could begin to develop some confidence that this person, again, merits some trust. We begin to build. It's relative though. And I tell people, you know what? Once that blind faith has been broken, it's like being cast out of heaven or thrown out of Disneyland. (laughs) The gates are locked. You ain't getting back in. All right. It's it's relative. It's probabilistic. What you want to do is see enough evidence to have confidence that things are okay. Does that give you a guarantee? Of course, it doesn't. No, you're in a new reality now. Uh, The other way I talk to clients about this is, and I talk about trust being built with demonstrated change over time. Yes. So it's not just, oh, I'm not interacting on the app, but it's also I'm demonstrating increased capacity to tell you what I think and what I want and to speak up honestly and to advocate, you know, whatever might have driven me to seek something outward. I'm actually now proving through my behavior that I'm going to be more open with you, you know, and that's also trust building. Absolutely true. And then, And then the other aspect of this also that the person who has been hurt by the broken faith is why did this happen? Because of the uh, the sad and unfortunate belief that if I understand why, it's going to make me safe. Mm. Well, we feel better if we know why, and 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 why typically is a story that we have consensus on. Okay, (laughs) right, right. Is the actual truth? Is it a fact? Yeah, I don't want to get too philosophical, but. I'm not sure we could fully know why, but we need to at least explore it. We need to develop some understanding of what seem to be the relevant factors that have contributed here and what are we doing about it? Yeah. What helps protect, what increases risk? Right. And so if I understand you right, the one, I think the last question I have, this idea that if you broke faith and I'm demanding to see your phone, that's the sex police, right? As opposed to you saying, hey, I want to show you my phone for a while. I want to give you the passwords. I want to, you know, that volunteering is is in the spirit of we're managing this together. You got it. And I'm going to, I'm going to take the initiative. I'm going to come at you on it if you want me to. Okay. And and also I'm going to assume I know what's going to reassure. What can I do that can offer you some reassurance? Yeah. Not, not a guarantee, not, not some false protection, but what, what's going to help Yeah, from where you're sitting, from where you're coming from? Yeah. Great. Where can people find you? I don't know if you only work in New York, <laughs> you know, pro- probably the way licensing works, but how? Well, the way licensing works right now, other than, you know, some temporary licenses that I'll get out of state. I'm a New York state licensed psychologist. So I work within the confines of the state of New York clinically. But I also, you know, for other professionals, I do a lot of supervision of folks uh, on their cases to help them understand this model and, and treat cases like that who are perhaps out of, out of state. Also, the uh, best way to access, if this information makes any sense to you, my website, which is cyberinfidelityhelp.com has really a treasure trove of essays and podcasts and uh, videos and all sorts of information, including a free downloadable guide to infidelity in the digital age, which which is useful to people who are dealing with this issue and even professionals to to take a look at. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate you spending the time. Chessa, thank you for having me. It's been my pleasure. You've been listening to Better Sex. 
please visit our website, bettersexpodcast.com, for show notes and additional episodes. And that's a wrap for today. I really hope you enjoyed the episode. If you are enjoying the podcast, if some of this material resonates with you and you would like to make a difference and make sure that this keeps coming out in the world once a week, ongoing, there are a couple things you could do to show your appreciation. The first would be to go to iTunes and rate and review the show. That really helps us be found by new listeners when you review the show on iTunes. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash iTunes. The other thing I want to invite you to consider is becoming a Patreon. For a small monthly pledge, you get some benefits. So for $2 a month, you get advanced access to every single episode. For $5 a month, you get a chapter of my upcoming new book. And for $10 a month, I host quarterly get to know you and question and answer chats over the web. And you get invited to that. I would love to have your membership in that become part of the Better Sex family. You can find a link at bettersexpodcast.com slash Patreon, which is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Again, thanks for listening. I'm glad you're here. Feel free to comment, ask questions, get in touch. I'd love to hear from listeners. Thanks. Thanks.